In this lecture, we'll be looking at the history, the causes, and the effects of the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution, which lasted from 1791 to 1804, was the only slave insurrection that directly led to the creation of a nation state. The Haitian Revolution was one of only two successful American independence wars, along with the American Revolution that attained lasting freedom prior to the 19th century and achieved it from a European colonial power. This revolution also had far-reaching effects uh, beyond the shores of this Caribbean island. Christopher Columbus landed on the island um, in 1492, naming it Hispaniola. However, there were existing indigenous societies on many of the islands of the Caribbean that extend back at least 6,000 years. Um, after the island became a Spanish colony, the Taino population, that's T-A-I-N-O, was wiped out uh, by violence and disease. In particular, smallpox was especially deadly to the island's original inhabitants, and a Taino population that once numbered um, at least in the hundreds of thousands, and some sources indicate perhaps a million or more, was eradicated within several decades of the arrival of the Spanish. The depopulation of Hispaniola, which a few historians refer to as genocide, uh, made the island one of the first major destinations for transatlantic slaves who were imported to meet Spanish labor needs in the region. The name Haiti would not be the official designation until 1804. The word is of Taino origin and perhaps also West African origin, meaning either mother of the earth or sacred land. The French took over the western half of the island of Hispaniola in 1664. The French West India Company was the impetus behind that. The French renamed their half of the island, which had been Santo Domingo, um, San Domingue, so the same Saint Dominic, but uh, just pronounced in French, San Domingue. Quickly, this French colony became the dominant sugar and coffee supplier to Europe. The island was an important source of revenue for the French government. Slaves provided the vast majority of the labor needed to exploit the island's wealth, and by 1789, there were over 500,000 persons of color on the island, but only 32,000 whites of European descent. Yet the, uh, the demographic and social structures of Haiti are much more complex than the simplistic black-white scenario often depicted in textbooks. Um, African slaves were the majority of the population, but there were also free uh, blacks who were wealthy, and there were also poor blacks who were free on the island. These groups um, had economic and political interests that did not necessarily sync up with each other, despite similarities in skin color. Uh, similarly, white plantation owners were a very small percentage of the total population of the island, but they only constituted a small segment of the white population. Poor whites far outnumbered wealthy whites. And again, they had quite different economic and political aims. There were also a significant numbers of mixed race peoples in San Domingue. These individuals could be found, too, in a wide range of economic conditions. Finally, there were a number of what were known as maronage communities, that word is on the slide here, uh, which were groups of runaway slaves who had formed their own communities in isolated rural regions. The word is derived from a Spanish term, cimarron, uh, and the word originally had connotations of a wild horse and began to be used to describe runaway slaves. You can see the, uh, the parallels, um, both in terms of um, uh, the beings, and also um, getting back to the idea of chattel slavery, or of slaves being something less than human, more like property. There were actually two main stages to the beginnings of the Haitian Revolution. In 1790, wealthy Jean de Coulure, I've got the word up there, uh, rebels staged a failed insurrection over their demands for full rights. Uh, the word Jean de Coulure translates roughly as gentlemen of color, and it's a short form of Jean de Couleur Libre, or uh, gentlemen of color who are free. The image on this slide 
uh, depicts a typical Jean de Coulure, and some of these individuals were quite wealthy. However, they were frustrated because even though they were just as wealthy and educated as uh, their white contemporaries, uh, they did not have the same political wealth, or excuse me, political rights as wealthy whites. Uh, many Jean de Coulure were slave owners, others were wealthy merchants, and they were not interested in abolitionism or even equal political rights for free people. They just wanted the rights that were enjoyed by other wealthy people who happen to have white skin. And, um, you know, they uh, they were much like, uh, you know, aristocratic-minded um, American revolutionaries who did not want to see um, rights extended to African Americans, to slaves, to even poor whites. Um, if you were landless during the American Revolution, um, in the eyes of some of the revolutionaries, um, they were not fighting for you. Um, the second phase in August of 1791 was a small-scale slave revolt in the north that quickly grew into a major uprising, and that revolt spread across the country. So you got these sort of two competing um, revolutions happening around the same time with very different um, aims. Uh, the slave revolt um, appears to have been one of the early leaders led by an ex-slave or a self-emancipated slave named Doty Bukman. Sometimes the name is Bukman Doty. Um, it's likely that Doty Bukman's uh, name might be a portmanteau or a morphing of the words book and man. Now, we do not know um, much about Bukman. He was apparently an ex-slave who worked as a slave driver and a coachman. Um, the word bookman um, may mean that he was a person of some religious significance. There are some who suggest that bookman means that um, he was a learned person. Others suggest that bookman means something like man of the book. Uh, so or either man of the Bible or man of the Quran. There are some scholars who um, try to make the case that bookman may have been um, a Muslim who was uh, um, enslaved or perhaps a other scholars suggest a person who had been baptized and was Christian or perhaps even some syncretic religion um, that was a mixture. Um, there's a legend that uh, he led this um, quasi-religious ritual at the start or early on in the, um, the slave revolt that carried some significance. It was a freedom ritual. That's one of the legends. Again, we don't have good documentary sources, and the documentary sources we have um, are written by uh, the French who were trying to put down the revolt. So uh, the, those sources may be, are, are in, are not maybe, those sources are problematic and they may have significant distortions to them. Um, some sources suggest that Bukman may have been a pr practitioner of Vodun, which we in the United States sometimes refer to as Voodoo. Uh, but again, we only know this are the French sources, and these sources may have been using the fear of Vodun to simply frighten people. Uh, we do know that Bukman was captured by the French and beheaded, and that his severed head was displayed in public to spread fear among rebels, as well as to perhaps dispel myths that Bukman was somehow invincible. So he's a quasi-legendary figure with some basis in reality, but uh, we can't know for certain um, many details of his life. Um, the revolution takes... Um, some interesting turns, and there's parallels with the French Revolution, which again is happening at the same time. So um, in 1794, um, the Jacobin dominated French Convention, this is the radical phase of the French Revolution, declared limited emancipation for slaves, um, both in France and in Haiti. Full rights for free people of color. This is very radical for its time. Uh, unfortunately, that phase of the French Revolution is rather short-lived. By 1795, a more conservative directory is running the show in France. But once you've sort of, uh, to keep the metaphor going of the genie in the bottle, once you've let that genie out, it is very difficult to put the genie back in. And um, uh, white landowners continued fighting to uh, reclaim their rights as slave owners. Um, some Jean de Coulure ended their struggle. Um, others continued fighting. So, I mean, it, it's still um, somewhat complicated at this time. 
but it is at this point, um, by 1794-95, that the revolution begins to take more of a race-based focus because um, some wealthy whites have left the colony by this time. Um, some, um, and, and there's of course been attrition through um, killings, um, and some um, Jean de Couleur have left, some Jean de Couleur have uh, moved to other places, some Jean de Couleur have joined um, with the various rebel factions. The colony of Saint-Domingue at this time was also invaded by the British and later the Spanish. Uh, France was embroiled in a series of wars with its European neighbors on the continent. So a very complex situation that has far-reaching um, connections. Um, one of the principal figures in the uh, Haitian Revolution and one of the most successful of the black commanders was a man named Toussaint Louverture who was a self-educated former slave. Um, he may have been the son of an African noble sold into slavery. Um, there are some contemporary sources that suggest this. This story may be legendary or even mythical, um, but it is clear that people in the time believed the connection, at least some people, and certainly this belief wouldn't have hurt Louverture and, and probably helped legitimize his status as a leader to be you know, uh, claiming descent from nobility. Uh, Louverture served uh, prior to the revolution and in the early phases in both the, at different times, the Spanish and the French armies. Uh, during this time, he learned a great deal about European military tactics and strategies, uh, appears to have a natural inclination for it because he uh, developed into uh, a very impressive record of defeating, uh, repeatedly defeating, um, European armies sent to invade and destroy his uh, nascent revolution. Uh, he led his troops in attacks against the Spanish. Uh, his forces defeated the last of the rebels on the island. Um, early on, he essentially won the island back for France when the, uh, during the more radical phases of the French Revolution. Um, Louverture also defeated the Spanish, um, carrying the revolution further onto the eastern half of the island of Hispaniola defeating the Spanish in Santo Domingo and freed the slaves on the eastern half of the island in 1801. Um, as leader of an independent San Domingue, it's still San Domingue at this point, it won't be Haiti until 1804, uh, he attempted to get treaties of recognition with U.S. and Great Britain, but was rebuffed in his efforts. Um, really, neither nation was desirous of, uh, of being seen as supportive of slaves overthrowing their masters for obvious reasons. Each nation had extensive slave populations under its control, either in its territory, in the case of the United States, or in its colonies, in the case of Great Britain. Um, Louverture made himself governor for life of Saint-Domingue. Um, it was at this point that Napoleon Bonaparte, who took power in 1799, decided to reclaim the former colony. Napoleon initially acknowledged Louverture as governor, but he sent French troops to Haiti. Louverture was tricked into believing Napoleon's promises, then was captured, sent to France in chains, and he died in a French prison. Uh, however, the large army that Napoleon sent to Haiti uh, was defeated by Haitian forces. Um, they were assisted by the viral disease yellow fever. Uh, this played a significant role in the defeat of the French. French troops had no immunity to this uh, subtropical and tropical disease. Um, it is in part also due to the defeat of his troops in Haiti that Napoleon agreed to the 1803 purchase, Louisiana purchase rather, with uh, the United States. So to sum up um, some of the reasons for the Haitian Revolution, um, free blacks and persons of color wanted full rights. Um, slaves, of course, wanted freedom. Enlightenment ideals to both of these groups definitely fueled the drive for freedom and independence. Um, we cannot overlook the fallout from the American and the French revolutions that contributed to the Haitian Revolution. This period is sometimes referred to as the Age of Atlantic Revolutions uh, to signify the influence that these various revolutions had on each other. And again, in the case of the Haitian and the French Revolution, these are really intertwined. Um, this revolution also contributed to greater instability in uh, the Caribbean and Latin America. In terms of effects of the Haitian Revolution, um, the 
revolution furthered the cause of abolition, um, certainly um, people who were um, in states of slavery or involuntary servitude could see an example of uh, folks who'd literally, as well as figuratively, thrown off their chains. The Haitian Revolution also soured Napoleon on the Americas, as we discussed. The Louisiana Purchase, the direct, um, a direct result in part due to the Haitian Revolution and Napoleon's desire to get out of the Americas. Uh, it was a humiliating loss for him. He lost his own brother-in-law in, the, in the, the fighting. Uh, there was widespread fear among slave owners in the U.S. and Latin America, but especially the U.S., over the Haitian Revolution. They could see um, a very dim potential future um, with the violence associated with revolts in many slave-owning regions. This led to increased security measures and much stricter laws regarding slave behavior and inter interactions with slaves. Uh, the Haitian Revolution served as inspiration to uh, other Latin American revolutionaries in the 19th century um, who could see um, that a people could throw off uh, European colonizers. And really, if you think about it, if an impoverished um, group of ex-slaves um, could be this influential, then certainly people with money and um, access to the tools that are needed for warfare um, could be just as successful. That brings to a close our brief look at the Haitian Revolution.